In this video, I'm going to talk about distributed locking. I want to first briefly explain where you might need distributed locking, and then I'll show you how you can approach implementing it. I'll show you an approach where you implement everything from scratch, and a very nice library that allows you to implement distributed locking in .NET. So let's first talk about some use cases for using distributed locking. This is a type of lock that works across a distributed system. Typically, you have a set of application instances that are scaled out, and you want to implement a synchronization primitive between them. This is where a distributed lock comes in. A typical application level lock doesn't work because it's only scoped to the memory of the single application. So where is this useful? Let's say you have a set of background jobs, and only one of them needs to execute at a given point of time. You want to scale out the jobs for performance, but there's this one job that can only be executed once, and we implement a distributed lock when it's time to run it, where only one of the active jobs is going to pick it up, and all of the remaining ones are going to continue until the next time the job is supposed to be executed. Then distributed locking is useful in message deduplication. This is a very common requirement in distributed systems, specifically when handling messages, there is a chance for consuming the same message multiple times. This is a rare use case, but nonetheless, it's something that you need to keep in mind when working with distributed systems. Then a very common use case for distributed locks is leader election. This is where you have some sort of system where multiple nodes need to cast a vote to come to the consensus of what is the correct state of the system, let's say. This is pretty common in NoSQL databases that run in multi-node setups. Then another common use case for distributed locks is enforcing uniqueness across your system. So let's say we have multiple API instances. A request can land on any one of them. The dumbest example I could give you is email uniqueness where you have multiple users trying to register and we want to prevent two users registering with the same email so we can add a lock around the register process and we can even be more granular and use the email as the key for the distributed lock that way we can ensure that only one of the users completes the registration now before i comment on why my example wasn't ideal let me add one more use case and that is the cache stampede problem so this happens when you have a distributed cache and the cache value for a given key expires so you might run into a situation where you have multiple application instances figure out that the cache key has expired all of them try to refresh the cache key and in turn execute unnecessary work. A distributed lock solves this by only allowing one application instance to update the cache value and the remaining application instances just fetch the value that's now living in the distributed cache. So for the previous example of enforcing uniqueness, I used an email as just something that's common knowledge and you'll be able to relate to, but a better solution for that specific use case is definitely a unique index in your database, which is thread safe and only one user would actually be able to complete complete the registration process and a distributed lock will probably be an overkill for that situation. Nonetheless, let's jump into the code and let me show you how you can implement a distributed lock using Postgres. So I'm going to be quick with the demo because I want to show you a few different solutions and I'll start from my Aspire app host. I want to add an Aspire integration and right off the bat I'll install Postgres and Redis. We're going to save Redis for later but just remember that we're going to install it right away. Now in my app host, I'm going to add my database by saying builder add Postgres, let's call it Postgres. And I'm going to say add database and let's call this database distributed locking. I'm going to reference the database from my API and I'm also going to wait for it before starting the API application. In my API itself, I'm going to add an Aspire client package, and I want to add one for Aspire MPG SQL. Now, to make my implementation simpler, I'm also going to look for Dapper, because I will have to write some SQL, and let me install the latest version of Dapper. And then let me close this down. I'll open up the program file and let me show you how we can implement a simple distributed lock using Postgres. I'll start by adding my data source. This is enabled by my Aspire client integration and I can say add mpg SQL data source and I need to specify my connection string name which is called distributed locking. It's also the name of the database that I created in my Postgres instance. So let me define a post endpoint. I'll call it locking demo and in the request arguments we need our mpg SQL data source which will allow me to to open up a database connection. And what I want to do here is use a very little known but quite useful Postgres feature called the advisory lock. It basically allows you to acquire an application level lock which is going to be held during the 
connection's lifetime. You can release the lock at any point in time, or you can allow the connection to expire, and that's going to release the lock automatically. So right out of the gate, this reduces the chance of any deadlocks occurring, which is very helpful when it comes to distributed locking. So let's create a new connection. I'll say await using var connection, and I'm going to open one by saying data source create connection. I need to make this an async delegate in order to be able to await inside, and then I'll define two helper methods. So the first one is going to return a long, and it's going to allow me to hash my key. Now the key is going to be a string, and this is more helpful when defining distributed locking keys. So I'll say something like big converter to int 64 this is a long and we're going to get this by saying sha256 hash data and then i'm going to say encoding utf8 get bytes and convert my key into an array of bytes optionally you can also add the start index from where to start reading the array of bytes then i'll add another helper method it's just going to return a task and i'm going to call this do work and it's going to return task delay 5000 to represent some work being executed in my application. So now I can define my key. We're going to call hash key. And let's say this is some nightly report that we want to execute at a given point in time, and we can only execute this from one background job. Now I'm going to acquire the lock, and I'll just update the data source method call to be open connection so that I don't have to think about opening the connection. And I'll say connection execute scalar async, and I want to return a Boolean value. And the actual query is going to be select pg try advisory lock, which is a built-in function. And I can pass in the argument, which is going to be my key. Now I'm going to pass in this parameter using an anonymous object where I can pass in the key value. And what I get back is a Boolean value that tells me if I managed to acquire the lock or not. So as I said, advisory locks allow you to acquire an application level lock during the lifetime of a Postgres connection. SQL Server also has a very similar feature. And let's say if we didn't acquire a lock, we can return results conflict, which should tell us that somebody else already has a lock. If I did acquire it, I can say await do work to simulate some work being done. And finally, I can say return results.ok. Now, it will probably be a good idea to run this in a try finally statement, where in the finally block, we want to make sure to unlock the advisory lock. So I'm going to copy what I have here, and I'll say connection, execute async. Here, we want to say pg advisory unlock to explicitly release the lock and then pass in the same key. So we should be ready to start the application and quickly demo this. I'm going to send a post request from Postman to my demo API endpoint. And you can see that we hit this breakpoint. Inside of it, we're going to open a database connection create a hash key, which should look a somewhat random number. And then we're going to attempt to acquire our lock. Now you can see I have some concurrent requests executing, which is actually good for our demo, and only one of these will be able to acquire the lock. So in this case, acquired is equal to true, and I will continue to do some work, and you can see in the concurrent thread, acquired is equal to false, and we're going to return conflict. After a few seconds, the do work method completes, we release the lock, and we're going to return results OK. So I'm going to press continue, and I do get back for line conflict. It turns out that this request was the thread that actually didn't manage to acquire the lock. But if I go into the Aspire dashboard, and we jump into distributed traces, we should see our requests here where we acquired the lock. So you can see PG try advisory lock and this completes. And then a few seconds later, we have the advisory unlock, which is going to release the lock on Postgres. To show you a more realistic example, I'll send this request from Postman. And while that's executing, I'll continue executing this request in the second tab. And you can see we're getting a 409 conflict because some requests acquired the advisory lock, while the original request is going to take five seconds, which is how long it takes to complete the fictional work to complete. So practically speaking, if if you're using Postgres or SQL Server, creating an application level lock and then using it as a distributed lock is the simplest possible solution. But writing all of this code isn't too ideal. So there's a library that I want to introduce you to called distributed lock. Let me look for it here. 
and I'm going to install the latest version once the search is able to find it. So here's the library that I wanted to show you. It's called distributed lock. I'll add the latest version and then let me show you how we can use it. This library actually offers distributed locks for many different services, including Postgres and Redis, which I'm going to demo in this video. So first let's start with Postgres. We'll say builder services and we want to add a new service as a singleton. And this is going to be the I distributed lock provider. You can also create the distributed lock yourself this isn't wrong however i'm going to go through the provider because it's going to allow me to somewhat simplify my code so here you just need to decide which type of provider you want to return so if i say new we can see all of the ones that are supported we have azure blob provider the file provider mysql oracle postgres redis sql server and there's also support for zookeeper now we want to use the postgres provider and this just expects a connection string so i'll say builder configuration get connection string and I'll use the connection string that I used above called distributed locking. So now I can use my distributed lock provider to try to acquire a distributed lock. I basically want to re-implement this endpoint using my new approach with the distributed lock library. So let's say app map post will say locking demo slash Postgres. And I'm going to say async I distributed lock provider. Let's define the distributed lock provider service. Let me define the service name. And then in my request delegate, I'll reuse the helper method from above for doing the so-called work. And then we want to acquire a distributed lock. We can do that by saying distributed lock provider, try acquire lock, and we can specify our key, which can be the same as above. Let's call it nightly report. Now, additionally, you can also specify a timeout for how long you want to attempt to acquire a lock. By default, with try acquire lock, this is going to be zero. Now note that this could return null, which means you basically didn't acquire the lock. So if distributed lock is null, then you can say return results conflict. Otherwise, this library has a very practical approach where you can wrap the distributed lock in a using statement and perform your work inside. And once the using statement completes or goes out of scope, it's going to automatically dispose of the lock and we can say return results okay. So you can see how much simpler this abstraction is over what I just showed you above, even though under the hood it's doing almost the same thing. So let's start the application. And then just to demo how this works, I'll send one request and a couple of concurrent requests. And you can see that we're getting a conflict response, which means our distributed lock is working. Eventually the original request completes after about five seconds. If we jump into the distributed traces, you can see a very similar story here where we have two spans going to our Postgres database. The first one is acquiring the lock by using PG try advisory lock and specifying the key. And then the second one is actually the one that's going to release the lock by saying PG advisory unlock. This is managed by the using state that I just showed you in the code. So what would it take to be able to use the same abstraction using the distributed lock library with Redis? Well, let me show you. We already installed the client library. I just need to add Redis to my app host. I currently do not have it here. So let's say var redis and we'll say builder add redis, add the name. I'll just call it redis. Let's reference it from my application and let's wait for it to be healthy before we start the API. The next thing we need is defining the client library. I don't have that installed yet. So I'm going to say add .NET Aspire package, and I want to install Aspire Stack Exchange Redis. This also takes care of telemetry, which is why I find these Aspire libraries useful. So once this is installed, I can go back to the program file and I can say builder add Redis client, and I just have to pass in the connection string name, which is going to be Redis. And if I comment this out, I can define a separate implementation is going to allow me to connect to Redis. Now, I actually think I finally found a good use case for keyed services. So let's configure this as a keyed singleton. The first argument should be the actual key. Let's call it Postgres. And the delegate slightly changes where you have access to the service provider and the key. So now this should compile. And let me actually copy this and I'll paste it here. And I just need to implement the same thing for Redis. So I have to update the key to be Redis. So now we have a different key service or a different key singleton. And we want to return a new instance of the Redis distributed synchronization provider. Now this one accepts an iDatabase instance and we have to actually resolve this from dependency injection. So I'll say service provider get required service. 
and we want to use the connection multiplexer from Stack Exchange Redis. And then I can say database, or actually this should be the connection multiplexer, and then call get database to get Redis database instance. If you're wondering where the connection multiplexer is coming from, this call here to add the Redis client is going to configure it and have it connected to the proper Redis instance. So now I can update my code to use key services, I'll say from key services and specify Postgres in this example. And to be able to use this with Redis, I'll just define a new API endpoint, update the route to Redis and update the key service registration or resolution, I believe, to Redis. And now I can start my app host. If we go into the Aspire dashboard, you can see our resources are up and running. We have Postgres, our database, Redis, and our application. If I send a request to the Redis endpoint, you'll see what the flow looks like, where we attempt to acquire the lock. And you can see that the lock itself is not null. So we're going to do the work, and this can take a couple of seconds. And after a few seconds, you will see that this completes, and we get back a 200 OK response. Now I'll send this request, and while it's running, I sent a concurrent request where you can see that the distributed lock is actually null. So we're going to, in this case, return a conflict response because the lock is already taken. To show you what this looks like in real time, here's me sending the original request and then sending the concurrent request a couple of times and you can see that we're getting 409 conflict until the initial request completes. If we go into the distributed traces, you can see our calls to the Redis endpoint and what we are interested in is this one here, where we have acquiring the lock in this span, and then five seconds later, releasing the lock in this span here. And of course, because we are using key services, I can update my endpoints to target the Postgres implementation. And if I send this request, and a concurrent request, everything is still going to work. And to confirm that this is using the Postgres provider, we can go into the distributed traces. And from here, you can confirm that this is acquiring the lock and then releasing the lock on our Postgres database. So let me know in the comments what you think about the distributed lock library and if you are using it from your applications. If you want to learn more about distributed systems, I think you'll enjoy watching this video next. Consider smashing that like button for the YouTube algorithm. Thanks a lot for watching this video. And until next time, stay awesome.